Hello, welcome to the first part of the Necromancer's evolutionary traits. A special thanks to my channel members for supporting me. And if you want to support you can join my channel membership or channel membership for as low as $1. Thank you very much. Let's begin. At the beginning of this series we see that. A really big war is going on. At the grandest kingdom last line of defense endeavor stronghold. A really big army of monsters is attacking. Soldiers are being overwhelmed by the monster number. Some monsters starts to scale the wall. One of the soldiers says, fight with all you have endeavor soldiers. Slay every single one of those orcs. A lot of orcs starts to scale the walls and killing the soldiers. Some really bright light appears in the sky. All the orcs starts to see toward that. Orcs goes to berserk after seeing the light. Deputy commander thinks, the orcs have gone berserk. It's now just a matter of time before the south gate falls. Their large number are troublesome. However ever the really problem will start when the orc lord joins the battle. Since the orc lord is different from the previous ones, as he is an aura master. Which means, that he can use special aura skills. The orcs have already taken the castle walls. Could this really be the end for us? Stop them. The monster starts to climb down the walls. They says, no matter what happens, protect the castle with you lives. One of the orc steps on a soldier. All the dead soldiers start to get up. Even the dead soldier under orc's feet grabs the orc. Everyone is really surprised and say, what, is that light? The corpses, are standing back up, all the undead starts to fight orcs. Soldier says, there's a necromancer. Why is a necromancer? Orc lord starts to attack as well. Our protagonist is in front of the orc lord. He says, defeating you with just normal corpses isn't possible. As expected of an aura master. Our protagonist looks less of a necromancer and more of an assassin. He bring out some more really strong looking undead monsters. He says, it's you turn now. Orc Lord is still killing undead army non-stop. Orc Lord uses a really powerful attack. The skeleton warrior comes from behind the Orc Lord and attack him. Orc Lord dodges the attack. The undead tiger man immediately attacks from the front. They both skeleton warrior and tiger man attacks Orc Lord at the same time. They start to fight. The tiger man uses a really powerful attack. Our protagonist is also kill the monsters with a sword. Some thinks, the world is vast. To think that a necromancer with such excellent swordsmanship, would be on the this battlefield is baffling. A giant undead is also killing a lot of orcs. The fairy monster is also killing the monsters. All the alive soldier are really surprised to see the our protagonist's power. They thinks, he managed to turn the tides of the battlefield just by himself. Even though the empire forbids black magic. Orc Lord gets really excited and says, I never thought mere corpse could force me to a halt. But don't you dare think you can defeat me with just this. Splendid. Our protagonist get in front of Orc Lord and says, finally a usable body. You have the qualifications to become one of my companions. Our protagonist extends his sword. He start to attack Orc Lord. Orc Lord grabs the sword with his aura hand. And jumps to attack. Our protagonist one in hand and leg gets cuts. But in the next moment it is reattached. Orc Lord is surprised to see that and smiles. They both starts to fight. Orc Lord attacks him. His sword hits a lot of bones. Our protagonist can summon the piles of bones to defend himself. Our protagonist thinks, I must become even stronger. Bones starts to come out the ground. And starts to cover his body. He thinks, for the sake of my own survival. And for the sake of those precious to me. His undead army is watching him. He looks really cool in that bone armor. He thinks, and also. Orc Lord gets really excited and says, Come great warrior who wishes to change the world. Entertain me in battle one last time. Our protagonist thinks, for me to continue living as Andrea's Cromwell. They both starts to fight. A lot of really big explosions starts to happen. Soldier are really surprised to see him fight. Even his own undead army is really surprised to see his power. Our protagonist's sword is covered with fire. Orc King is also attacking him. Prologue ends here. After that we see Rodlin Academy. The Empire's more prestigious, nurturing academy, where those deemed promising come to learn. While this is where those who are hiding their identities gather. Someone says, Hey Andreas. Didn't you say it was here? Andreas is our protagonist. He says, Sorry. 
There are a lot of dead monsters around them. That man says, to think you can't even remember the location of the body you worked on last week. Andreas thinks, we are researchers of the forbidden black magic, necromancers. If someone were to find it out, I would be executed on the spot. That is why I conduct my experiments in secret. That man says, back away, I will now begin. They start the ritual, it fails. He says, let's end it here for today, clean up and then head back up. Andreas thinks, well, I didn't learn anything today either. He starts to clean it up. He thinks, even though it's dangerous doing this, I don't seem to be getting much out of it. But it's not like I can just quit. After all, this is the only place I can read proper books concerning black magic. Sorry for taking so long. That man says, if it takes you half a day just to do the clean up, when will you be able to do the full job by yourself? Andreas thinks, because you don't teach me anything, I have to learn by myself. He says, I entrusted a simple job to you and you're already that nervous. I won't tolerate another failure. Andreas says, I will do my best. He says, I don't know if I can count on you, but I will give you another chance. Go to the Binehales National Graveyard and bring me another body. Don't forget, I am the one who took you in despite you being an orphan. So you have to constantly prove you are worth living. If you can't, you already know what will happen. Andreas thinks, I will just become, another body of his to perform experiments on. He says, so do it well. Now leave. He says, yes, sir. Andreas gets out of there and thinks, he didn't even give me the travel expenses. Other students looks toward Andreas with really surprised look on their face. Andreas says, I'm not some kind of spectacle out of my way. He thinks, I have not the slightest idea of how to get out of this. His full name is Andreas Cromwell, Magic Department Third Year, Untalented. An orphan from a fallen family. A typical man who curries face with the strong and slams the weak. The worst rated of the academy, a third-rate villain. The type of character that nobody wants to play as. But even though I don't want it, I have to keep living as Andreas. He says, I am Makoto Kaneshiro and I am inside the world of great sin. I was a member of the special forces who couldn't adapt to the life of a normal member of society. And for me, the only thing that supported me in my heart was the great sin. So I just forgot about everything and immersed myself in the game. And when I finally managed to clear it on my twelfth week. Makoto Kaneshiro, someone who possessed detailed knowledge of my personal information and gaming habits called me. As I was surprised, I tried to turn off my computer instantly. But without realizing, I turned into a character of the game at a point half a year before the main story would begin. Andri is a character who was followed by the shadow of death. Why you ask? Because all the characters go through the same event. They discover Karen's true identity and then kill him. Together with me, so if I don't find a way to get away from Karen before the main story begins. Then I won't be able to escape being involved with the main characters. Can I really clear this? I have no choice but get stronger before it begins. The only thing I can count on is the two special traits you get for playing 13 weeks. But one of them is random and I got the dual core trait. That makes you able to use both magic and swordsmanship. I doubt that I can survive just focusing on one of them. And that leaves me with the other main trait that I can choose. So I have no choice but to choose one that synergizes the most with my necromancy. He says, chose characteristic. A list of traits appears in front of him. He thinks, seeing it for the first time, there really are a lot to choose from. Chinese Dao. Weapons path probably not those. First let's look at the ones I haven't seen before. I'm certain I can find the solution in here. He the trade evolution. He chooses evolution. He thinks, is the phenomenon that adapts a living creature for it to real higher places. It's a trade I haven't seen before in the game so far. What is really need right now, was something that allowed me to outgrow those castle walls, and evolutionary development. There's no need to think further. Evolution trait selected. I can finally see it. What kind of future this trait will bring for me. We see him behind the master of a dragon and he is the king of everything. He thinks, in this world, I will definitely survive and clear the game as Andreas. The first part of the necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, 
Please subscribe and like. And if you want to support me financially you can join my channel membership only for $1. Channel membership and Discord links are in the description if you want support me. And a special thanks to all my channel members for supporting me. Thanks for watching. Hello. Welcome to the second part of the Necromancer's Evolutionary Traits. A special thanks to my Patreon for supporting me. And if you want to support you can join my channel membership or Patreon for as low as $1. Thank you very much. Let's begin. At the beginning of this part we see that. At Maple Leaf Dormitory Rodlin Academy Free Facility, Andreas thinks Andreas was a very minor villain in the game but seeing it, firsthand, he really was so powerless. He can barely use a single elemental magic. My only immediate asset is his necromancy, which is why I chose the evolution trait. I'll stop by the underground research room before I head to the graveyard, since I can't be wasting my time. I need to get stronger as fast as possible, not only for the event. There are countless characters that can kill my beside Sharon. He starts to read some books called Black Magic Introduction, I Will Become a Black Mage. Troublesome Black Magic. He thinks, what horrible titles. Each could get me instantly killed if I'm discovered with it. But there's something that can kill me in this room right now. If I'm not mistaken, she is clearly a vampire. The vampires in this game are unfazed by direct sunlight and are beings that are capable of wielding powerful magic. She's not the kind of being that Sharon CNA get his hands on easily. She's probably the equivalent of a mid-game boss. She says, Hey, won't you help me get out of here? After that we see is on a train going to the graveyard he thinks, frankly speaking, that was tempting. Perhaps it's a godsend gift. She says, If you let me out, I will kill Sharon. Aren't you afraid that he will kill you someday? How about it? He thinks, as expected of a vampire, she saw through my caution with Sharon. I haven't been acting like Andreas for a while now. So maybe it was because of that. If I release you, there's no guarantee that you will let me go safely. She says, I swear it. I won't kill you. He thinks, but would a higher being like her keep a promise with a human? She says, it's the truth. I swear. He thinks, am I supposed to just believe that? He says, I'll think about it. If I betray my teacher right away, things would get troublesome. She says, hey, there's no time for that. Release me this instant. He thinks, let's try researching more about vampires. Perhaps there is a book about handling them somewhere. The next stop is at the National Graveyard. Right now, we are arriving at the Harfell Station. The doors will open on the right side. Andreas is pulling a really big bag. He thinks, this really is the body of a mage. Moni is a think. But for now I have to put up with using physical strength. Here is where the black mages gather their corpses, the national graveyard. He says, I've come from Jenny's house. I'm here with her grandson. They ask, did you bring flowers? He says, I've brought. 13 Azure Sky Irises. They says, is that so? Come in. There is a man who says, my hip hurts. He see Andreas and says, nice timing. As promised, a knight's corpse. Take it or leave it. Andreas says, thank you very much. Andreas starts to pull the knight and says, damn he's heavy. He packs him into his suitcase and says, now let's leave before it gets too late. It feels like I've seen that name on the gravestone somewhere before. He thinks, no way. Is this the Aura Master Nicol Liefel? Someone who spent decades in isolated training following the path of the sword. But even though he dedicated his whole life to the sword and became an Aura Master, at this moment, he died of old age. That was one of the game's Easter eggs. I still wonder why they added that in. But here nobody knows that Nickel became an Aura Master at the end. If I create a Death Knight with this body. Of course not even Sharon can create a high-ranking one. But after I evolve, it'll be a whole other story. So I definitely need to find a body with good latent abilities. He says, Sir Paimon. Paimon says, do you want another body? Either way, it's a no. Got it? You have to get Karen's permission first. Please think of my position here. Andreas says, what if I trade this ring for one? This ring is engraved with a count's crest. If I sell it, I can make a fortune. Is he really offering it? Andreas says, I have nothing but this old ring of mine. And as a mage, results matter the most to me. So I will gladly offer it. Paimon says, is that so? I will definitely hide it from my teacher. So please take it. Paimon says, fine then. I'll give in. Andreas thinks, even though it's the ring of a fallen noble household, it's still irresistible. Andreas says, thank you very much so let's dig up this one then. 
Wait, that's a tough one. Andreas thinks, the clear future I saw yesterday is finally starting. When I go back, I will start my necromancer training as soon as possible. I'll be in your care, my first subordinate. After that we see Sharon says, it seems like a usable body. Take care of the reagents while I'm gone. And of course, you'll be responsible for the aftermath too. Andreas thinks, I just returned, and he's already ordering me around. I do chores better when I'm annoyed. Perhaps my body instinctively remembers. I ask say to quickly finish this up, so that I can start studying right away. At my current level, can I really use Nickel's body? With my skill level, a skeleton is the most I can work with for now. It's probably possible to evolve thing with the evolution trait, but I'm not certain because I haven't tried it out yet, and I don't even have money, so I can't practice on another body. Vampire says, Hey, how long are you planning to make me wait for? He says, You weren't sleeping? I already sighed I would NT kill you. Let me out. Do you really want to live the rest of your life as Karen's assistant? Andreas gets close to her. He thinks, I was waiting for you to talk to me. She says, That's right. Have you finally made up your mind? He thinks, I've always wondered how Sharon even managed to tie you down. But as I read this, I figured out the answer. She says, What's wrong? Why are you standing there in silence while staring at me? Are you still in doubt? She says, Hurry up and make up your mind. Otherwise, I might still kill you even if you release me. He says, I will let you out. I can't stand Sharon anymore. She says, so you've decided. Now remove my restraints. He says, however, you must swear on your family's name. That you won't kill me. He thinks, judging by her reaction, the content of the book was true. When a vampire swears on their family's name, they are prohibited from breaking the promise they made. She says, I understand. I swear on Lucifer's name. He thinks, that easy. System says, you have fulfilled the conditions. An evolvable specimen has been detected. Angela Lucifer's evolution probability 55%. He thinks, what? Evolution probability? Just because she swore? System says, evolution. Unique. Targets who accumulate enough experience can evolve from a lower grade to a higher grease. Can be used on all targets they are not hostile. A genetic divergence can occur. Would you like to evolve it? He thinks, seems like I can use it on other entities apart from my summons. This is my chance to test it out before using it on Nickel. He thinks, even if something happened, it's not my fault. She says, what is it? Did you deceive me? He presses yes. She starts to scream with a lot of pain. She says, hey you bastard. What the hell did you? She starts to feel even more pain. He thinks, what the hell is happening to her? He says, hey, vampire. Pull yourself together. Shit, now I don't even know if I succeeded. But I learned one more thing about this trait. Andreas thinks, if I can evolve entities that are not my direct summons, I could certainly evolve my own. So it should be fine to summon Nickel right now. Let's do this. He says, skeleton summoning. System says, basic necromancy skeleton summoning has been activated. One corpse has been detected. Target that is capable of exercising necromancy has been detected. Additional effects have been applied. Andreas thinks, this is the amount of mana needed just to summon one skeleton. A skeleton appears in front of him. System says, basic necromancy skeleton summoning was successful. One skeleton rank legendary has been summoned. Basic necromancy skeleton summoning level has been raised from 1 to 3. System says, the corpse's level is high. Bonus statuses have been applied. The corpse's level is extremely high. Its tier will be raised. It is turned into a skeleton soldier. The corpse's level is transcendent. It can regain a little of its sense of self from the past. He thinks, nice, that was a huge success. It even became a grade higher than a regular skeleton. Skeleton stats window appears saying, skeleton soldier legendary. Nickel Lifeil. Undead. Tier 2. Traits, sense of self. Mastery, sword. He thinks, and even its traits. Mastery. It's the state of being at the pinnacle or ultimate stage of proficiency such that there is nothing else beyond. He thinks, it's the only trait that can be attained through effort and growth, but to think that a skeleton possesses it. Andreas says, you really were a sore master when you were still alive, huh? Skeleton uses a hand sign. Andreas says, you will be in my care? He says, I guess the same goes for me. He thinks there's still about a year until Karen's death. If I want to survive, there are a lot of things I need to do. Even if I leave my summoning skill alone, its proficiency is still rising. Anyways, 
I'll let Nickel out of the room for now. System says, there are currently one out of five. Summons in your storage. Would you like to summon one skeleton soldier? He says, yes, come out. It'd be bad if someone seems him. Let me dress him up first. Nice. No matter how you look at it, he looks like a human now. It seems like the Easter egg description was true. Andreas says, he died while training and he's still training even though he's dead? It's good for me anyways. Since I've finally found a way to cultivate this shit trait of mine. He says, Nickel, won't you teach me swordsmanship? Cromwell Informational Scroll. Great Sin World Overview. In the world of Great Sin, both talents and its rank are important factors. The shorter the name, the stronger the talent is, for example. Movement is the highest level of physical abilities there is, as opposed to motion prowess that would be a grade below. Genius, exceptional, extraordinary, ordinary, poor. The second part of the necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, please subscribe and like. And if you want to support me financially, you can join my Patreon only for $1. Patreon and Discord links are in the description if you want to support me. And a special thanks to all my Patreons for supporting me. Thanks for watching. Hello. Welcome to the third part of the Necromancer's Evolutionary Traits. A special thanks to my Patreon for supporting me. And if you want to support, you can join my channel membership or Patreon for as low as $1. Thank you very much. Let's begin. At the beginning of this part, we see that. Skeleton is training Andreas' swordsmanship. He swings the stick and says, like this. Andreas thinks, my body is creaking like crazy. Thank God you taught me how to keep up with a body like this. It's kind of like having a crazy aura master as a teacher. Or should I perhaps say that they're all crazy? If I'm taught correctly, I'll be able to use aura, and in the future, I'll be able to switch between aura and mana, and I won't need to choose just one because I have the dual core trait. I'll be able to walk the path of a magic swordsman since I'll be using both the mana in my heart and my dantian. It'll be hard for me to grow, but if I get past the initial stages, I'll be stronger than anyone. Just like the great Emperor Edmund, the one who founded the Empire. Skeleton pinches him. What the hell did you do so suddenly? Skeleton says, focus. Andreas says, how can you grip me so strongly when you're just a pile of bones? Andreas thinks, I was a member of the Special Forces, so physical training is a breeze for me. I'll teach you a lesson or two about guts, Andreas. You skeleton, if you pinch me one more time. After that we see that he is drinking tea and thinks, since I skipped class today and let Nickel out, how much did my necromancy level up? He thinks about two points in five hours. It went up a lot faster than I thought. Of course, after reaching beginner grade, it should be a lot slower. He thinks it'll take 200 hours to reach beginner necromancy. Come to think of it, Sharon hasn't called me for a while, has he? The vampire looks the same, so he probably did not find out. It's taking a lot of time for the evolution to finish, so nothing probably went wrong. Nickel is training right beside him. He says, I know that you don't get tired since you're an undead, but you're something else. If I had potions, I could also train while healing myself forever. He thinks of two potions. First is healing potion. It heals internal injuries and heals fatigue. And second is regenerating potion. It heals external wounds and amplifies one's recovery rate. But there's no way a poor person can afford them. If I make them myself, I can probably spend less on the costs of making them, but it's not as easy as in the game. I know the necessary ingredients, but I don't know the specific ratio. So it's better for me to attend some of the classes to fill up my knowledge. He goes to the potion calls. Students there say, why did he come to potion class? Probably to pick up girls. His family's already ruined. What is he even doing here? Andreas thinks, I hear you, you bastards. Endure it. I'm not here to stand out at all. A teacher says, silence, let's start the third lecture. Professor Vauban's class, Intermediary Medicinal Herbalism. Andreas thinks, the contents and events haven't strayed so far. Now just go to the part about the mixing rates, please. Teacher says, the next one we'll be talking about will be the method for making a physical reinforcement potion. I've said before that it's based on Mohen leaves and three other materials, right? Andreas thinks, the contents of the lecture and my game knowledge aren't matching. Even though it's an intermediary potion, you're teaching a potion with so many side effects? Andreas says, teacher, can I ask you a question? He says, please ask away, Andreas. Andreas asks why don't you add Hong Pishi extract and moderate root bark? Teacher says, why should I add those in? If you want to add those, then just go ahead and make a soup. 
Andreas thinks, what I said right now were all the necessary ingredients to make a physical reinforcement potion, so what's with those reactions? Maybe this recipe hasn't been discovered yet? Even though I went through the trouble of going to the class, my knowledge is way better than what I just learned. Maybe it's better for me to study alone, after all. After that he goes to the Academy Grounds Research Department. He is trying to make potions, but he is failing again and again. He says, not again. He thinks, even though I know the recipe, what I need right now is a reliable way to make them. Also, the materials cost a lot more than I thought. I'll go broke soon. What if someone helped me? No way anyone would help a trashy person like Andreas. A female student gets there. She says, as expected, Senior Andreas is here. He thinks, shit. Why did a playable character come here? She's the one playable character who's a genius at potion brewing. Lucia Everlast. She shouldn't be close to Andreas, so why is she here? She says, it seems like you've been failing a lot. Andreas thinks, leave her be. If I ignore her, maybe she'll leave. What were you experimenting on? He says, it's a secret. He thinks, even though I went to class and got nothing out of it, my problems keep increasing. She says, you really are bitter, aren't you? Fine. It's not like I thought someone like you would propose something first. She says, Senior. Won't you study with me? Don't you think it's a good idea? There is no need for me to refuse. He says, What do you want? She says, Is it weird for me to want a research partner? He says, You don't gain anything out of this. She says, The demand gratitude, nothing less. It seems like you have some kind of talent and could create some amazing things. I look forward to medicines that don't yet exist in this world. He thinks, I was just trying to make medicine for myself. The reason Lucia is so well-versed in potions isn't just because she has talent for it. It's because if she doesn't find a way to heal the disease she has, then she'll eventually die because of it. Since, even famous doctors and pharmacists couldn't heal her, she had no choice but to study it herself. This disease is a grave one that was granted by the system itself. But if you're not like someone like me, who played the game Atone, you wouldn't be able to find a cure but for me to meet someone as intelligent as her. As I said, the last thing I need is someone to find my real identity. Looks like she heard what I said in class and needed me because of it. If I just carelessly get myself tangled up with her, my life will just get shorter. Andrea says, I'm not interested. Leave. Piona Mushroom. She says, you didn't say it in class, but don't you need to add that, too? He thinks, the main material that nobody but I should know of. She says, if you add it there, Shouldn't you be able to make the potion? I knew intuitively. If you wish, I can help you. Andreas says, you're saying this just because you're Rick. Once you've completed what you came to do, leave. He thinks, I won't give up my life just because of your attractive proposal. She says, fine. I'll give you some time to think about it. Since I think you'll change your mind soon. He says, I don't need to think about it. He thinks, even though I won't be worrying about anything, the risks are too high. He starts to train. He thinks, I can find the ratios myself. The problem is the money. As I thought I need a way to make money first. Is there any good idea that comes to mind? Andreas says, you really know when I'm not focusing. After the training ends, I'll have more time to think about it carefully. Is there really no viable way for me to get money? Andreas thinks, the only idea I have right now is to beg my sister for money after she sent that letter saying that she misses me. Isn't this the exact same thing that the previous Andreas did? No matter how much of a scumbag you are, this is not the way to make money. I swear this will be the last time. Another female student sees him and says, Andreas Cromwell? For him to be walking around while carrying a book. Did he finally manage to get the determination to do something? She says, even if he changed, there's no way to fix his trashy personality. He thinks I forgot about it. Diane Alvin, the genius magician and young lady of the Alvin family. Another character who can easily kill me in the academy. We got along pretty well when we were kids, but because the Cromwell family had lots of debt to pay, we eventually grew apart. Andreas did some pretty bad things since then, so she would probably kill me just by me talking to her. Either way, my dying wouldn't be weird at all. As I thought, asking my younger sister for money is the best option right now. After that we see the capital Rodlin. Andreas says, it should be around here. Someone says, You've come, Andreas. I sent so many letters, but you didn't answer any of them. What happened? He says, I'm sorry for making you have to work, Amy, even though you're a lady of accounts household. She says, It's not like you to say something like this. 
It's not your fault anyway. She is Amy Cromwell, and Dyrus' younger sister. She says, Why are you making such a serious face? Do you need more money again? She brings out an envelope and says, I thought about it and prepared some for you. She says, You can't spend it carelessly, okay? He says, Thank you, Amy. I'll definitely pay you back. Where's your ring, Andreas? He says, The engraved ring? I took it off so I wouldn't lose it. She says, You're taking good care of it, right? He thinks, I can't say the truth to her. She says, You didn't do it, did you? No matter what, you shouldn't have. He says, I'm sorry. She says, Get out. I don't want to see you anymore. He says, Wait. She says, Don't come here. You don't have to pay me back anymore. He says, I'll get it back. He thinks it must have been a really important item for her. It's my first time seeing Amy so angry. What's this miserable feeling? I have to get that ring back as soon as possible. What meaning is there in life when you're simply existing? I wasn't happy when I survived alone back there either. I'll have to make it with what I got. I'll accept Lucia's proposal. The third part of the necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, please subscribe and like. And if you want to support me financially, you can join my Patreon only for $1. Patreon and Discord links are in the description if you want to support me. And a special thanks to all my Patreons for supporting me. Thanks for watching. Hello. Welcome to the third part of the Necromancer's Evolutionary Traits. A special thanks to my channel members for supporting me. And if you want to support, you can join my channel membership or Patreon for as low as $1. Thank you very much. Let's begin. At the beginning of this part, we see that. At Potion Manufacturer Experiment Report. Someone says, Hey, you get up and run a little. You've stayed like this for a whole week inside your room like a neat. Only idiots do those things. Andreas says, Lucia's also lazying around today while I'm pushing myself. Using your spare time to train and do experiments is pretty tiresome. But sometimes, she switches up and helps in making things go faster. Lucia is sleeping. Andreas is calling her and says, why do I feel like I am the only one working here? She says, you're imagining things. Andreas thinks, she always makes me mad. She says, instead of doing nothing, decrease the amount of moderate and increase the amount of Tador's tree essence. He says, got it. Andreas thinks her intuition is really precise, and sometimes, she even gets into the heart of the problem. I'm doing this because of the money, but working together really was the best answer. Andreas is mixing stuff together. System says, you have manufactured a physical reinforcement potion intermediary grade. Audrey starts to laugh. She says, what happened? Did you fail again? He says, it worked. Andrea says, I know it's really sudden, but the potion experiment report ends here. System says, talent potion brewing buff type ordinary has been acquired. Conditions have been met. Andrea says, I got a new talent. System says, Andrea's Cromwell's talent. Evolution probability of buff type ordinary grade potion brewing is 32% evolve? He thinks what the hell does this mean? So I can also evolve traits? Does that mean I can basically evolve anything if the conditions are fulfilled? 32% the value. It's even lower than the when I evolved the vampire. This is incredible. There are basically no side effects. Anyway, let's save it for now. She says, it can even be used daily. Let's go make a request to the potion examination committee right away. Audrius says, you can do this part since I've basically done all the work so far. She says, I'm gonna be busy with my midterm starting tomorrow, right? But since you made it easy for me, I will take care of it for you. He says, so you were slacking off on purpose. System window appears saying, Angela Lucifer evolving. Remaining time, 14 days, 21 hours, 33 minutes. Angela thinks, what the hell did I do? My whole body's burning and in pain but I feel like there's something more to this pain. After that we see an instructor says, when we reach the midterms evaluation spot, please gather so that we can explain how it's going to work. Andreas thinks, if it's Lucia, she can easily pass the first examination. After that, there's the magic tower, where the last part is done. I've been training a lot, so my swordsmanship and necromancy has increased considerably. It's fine as long as I manage to pass the midterms. And the vampire evolution is about to finish, so I could probably check up on her. If I give an excuse when I go back, it'll probably fine for me to check on her. A girl says, Hey, Diane, what do you think the midterms will be about this time? The request and the group members will be random, right? 
If you're lucky, it'll be a breeze. Diane says, I wonder no matter who I get paired with, it shouldn't matter. She says, but it's not that simple. What if you get into the same group as him? Instructor says, in one minute, we will be arriving at Orkland training station. He says, everyone get off. They get off the train and instructor says, as stated previously, the third year's midterm exams will be a group test with random members. Each group will be composed of three students from the warrior department, one student from the magic department, and a supervisor. The group will have until Monday to complete the approved task. I wish luck to everyone participating. Then, let's start announcing the groups. Audrius thinks, shit. In the academy, there are countless villains besides me and Sharon. And just in this exam, two are in my group. First one is a player who fought the cult fanatic Hazar Gapri. And the other is the academy's indiscriminating murderer, Vivin the Lunatic. Why am I in the same group as them? Even my luck is that of a trashy characters? Someone says, hey, you. You saw the photos, right? I'm Christopher. I'm in the same group as you. Nice to meet you. Seems like you're training like a warrior, even though you're a magician. You disgust me. Don't get in my way. Hazar says, hello, my name is Hazar Gapri. And I think being an unfriendly warrior is a big problem. Andreas thinks, here comes the fanatic. Vivian Belkin tells them his name. Andreas thinks, crazy guys. Christopher says, who are you saying isn't sociable? Andreas thinks, they're even a mob like Knight in this group. They says, so you're saying I should leave a magician copying the warrior's training style alone? I'm fine with it since everyone should get a little bit of physical exercise anyway. Andreas thinks, don't fight, you idiots. They're not the only problem in this group. Why do we also have a Yankee for a supervisor? This is the worst group ever. Instructor says, when all the group members are gathered, the group can go get its request. Everyone please try to come back alive. Andreas thinks, coming back with this group? They are riding a train. Supervisor says, I'll formally introduce myself. I'm Ivy Claire, the supervisor of Group 9. Here's what our group has been tasked with look over it carefully. Investigate a village in Baron Balarik's territory. There's a rumor that the landlord of the village of Thrym has been murdered. We sent an investigator two weeks ago, but he has also disappeared. We are therefore requesting an investigation be conducted by the Mercenary Guild. She say, any questions? Andreas thinks she's much more aggressive compared to the gang. Ivy Claire. Apart from becoming the youngest aura master in the near future, no more information is known about her character. Her skill is real, but I'm afraid her personality will make things difficult. Ivy says, I heard that Seaweed Head over there tried playing a knight recently. A mage like you? What a joke. Can you even lift? Andreas says, I don't want to hear that from someone who need to chew on jerky to keep her cool. She says, I can't smoke here. Do you want me to chew on you instead? He thinks, please arrive soon. They reach their destination. Balarik says, you've come a long way welcome. It is a shame that this incident has happened, but I'll briefly explain the situation to you. The landlord of Frim Village is my nephew. He was a baronet, but he had no family. That's all the information I know. Ivy says, thank you for the details. Servant comes and says, my lord, the young master is. Andreas sees them talking. Balarik gets up and says, I have to attend to something, so if you'll excuse me first, best of luck to you all. Servant says, forgive our rudeness, the young master is unwell. Ivy says, it's all right, we've gotten all of the needed details, we'll be leaving soon. Andreas sees the servant. They come out and Ivy says, good job watching over the equipment. She says, he sure is calm even though his nephew is missing. He reeks. Hey, seaweed head. Is that why you insisted for us to depart immediately today? Andreas says, yes, there were many things seemed suspicious. Especially the part about the missing investigators who lost contact. It sounded like a fabricated story. And it's also odd that they only sent an investigator once, even though a month had passed. But the most suspicious thing was the butler's attitude. Butler says, if you leave now, you will probably reach there by nightfall. It would be better for you to rest up for today and leave tomorrow. Ivy says, I appreciate your concern, but no, thank you. Our job comes first. Andreas says, after we refused to stay, he looked as if his plan had failed. Above all, they looked anxious. Their trembling, their breathing and behavior, down to even their slightest gesture. It's clearly how someone would behave if they behave if they were hiding something. Ivy says, all right, let's head for Thrym Village right away. Andreas thinks, 
This request, there's definitely more to it. Christopher says, should we get a place to stay first when we arrive? Ivy says, no, the investigation takes precedence. Let's start by investigating the landlord's castle. First, Andreas thinks, the whole thing is suspicious, but all we can do for now is to check it out directly. Andreas feels something and thinks, what? My mana has suddenly started to shake. It's getting stronger the closer we get to the village. What's going on? Something happens. Hazar says, hey, coach. Christopher says, move. He says, oi, what are? Coach is acting like a crazy man. And even horses are going crazy. They're going really fast. Christopher says, Hazar, something's wrong with the coach. He says, what's wrong? Ivy breaks the door. She sees something and says, damn it. It's too late. Everyone brace for impact. We're going to crash into the main gate. They get crashed into the gate. Everyone in the village is dancing. Like madmans. They come out of the carriage. Christopher says, Oi, big head, what's going on here? What's wrong with the villagers? A mage like you should know. Andreas thinks, that settles it. This is more than just a mana anomaly. The fact that my mana is reacting means. It's black magic. The fourth part of the necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, please subscribe and like. And if you want to support me financially, you can join my channel membership or Patreon only for $1. Patreon and Discord links are in the description if you want to support me. And a special thanks to all my Patreons for supporting me. Thanks for watching. Hello. Welcome to the fifth part of the Necromancer's Evolutionary Traits. A special thanks to my channel members for supporting me. And if you want to support, you can join my channel membership or Patreon for as low as $1. Thank you very much. Let's begin. At the beginning of this part, we see that. They grab a child. Vivian thinks this is not the strength of a normal kid. Hazar says, since he was dancing for the whole day, his feet are really worn out. Just as I thought. It's a curse. So there is a connection between our request and the curse, right? Christopher says, the landlord has been gone for about a month. If they've been dancing since then, they should. V.E. died from exhaustion a long time ago. Andreas says, it seems like there's someone taking care of them so that they don't die. We probably got dragged into something troublesome. Andreas thinks, Andreas didn't die here in the game. If we had taken the butler's suggestion and rested in the castle, the Baron would have covered this up. But since we came to the village instantly, the situation changed. We've got dragged into a dangerous situation. The mana I felt is at about the same level as Karen's. But to be able to use it on such a large scale seems weird. Andreas realizes something and thinks, no way. Does he have an artifact? Christopher says, hey, big head, what's wrong? We have way too few clues right now. Let's search the landlord's house first. The first step is collecting information. After that they go back to the landlord's house, there are some people are burning out of the house. They break the door and goes inside. There are a lot of people dead inside the house. Christopher sees one of them and says, Those clothes, aren't they from the Empire investigation team? It seems like a long time has passed since they died. Andreas says, Perhaps we won't be able to solve this ourselves. Based on everything so far, I think that this is the work of a black mage. Ivy says on what grounds? He says, it feels like someone is amplifying the emotions of the people here and exchanging them for magic power. Ivy says, the driving force of black magic is human emotions, after all. So the landlord was probably also killed. Perhaps, because he would have obstructed them. Christopher says, so, those burning bodies outside are part of black magic ritual? Andreas says, maybe. Ivy says, we will know the truth eventually after capturing those criminals. So let's search every part of the mansion first. They start to look around the whole mansion is a mess. Hazar says, we haven't found anything so far, not even the landlord's corpse. Vivian says, Hazar, look outside. They look outside. All people are coming from the village. Andreas thinks, the perpetrator is finally moving. They say, what do we do? It seems like they noticed us. It's as if they were waiting for us to enter the building. Supervisor Ivy, what do we do? She says, let's stop the search for now and leave the building. Hazar, go find an escape route. Hazar starts to run and says, yes, there are a lot of people blocking the way. Hazar says, they are already on the second floor. All of the zombies attack him. Christopher barely blocks them. He says, go protect the mage at the back. I will take care of the front. A really big explosion happens. Christopher goes flying towards the Andreas because of the explosion. 
Andreas is really surprised Christopher is injured badly. He says, Christopher. Hey, Christopher. She says, they are still coming. He seaweed head. What are you doing? Let's get out of here. Vivin, the window. She breaks the window. And they jump out. Ivy is holding Andreas on her back and Hazar is holding Christopher. Village men are still following them. Andreas wakes up and thinks, I got a flashback from my last operation just now of all times. He uses grease. And earth shield. Ivy says, what is it with you? Do you think you are alone? Don't use up your mana recklessly. Can you track the black mage's location right now? He says, I think I can if I do it right now. Since he's using his mana so blatantly, I will find him easily. He activates mana detect. He finds him. He says, they're at the house at our 9 o'clock, about 100 meters away. Ivy says, well done, seaweed head. Supervisor Ivy, please wait. Black Mage sees them. Ivy breaks the door and goes inside, she says. Looks like we're right on the money. This could be where the Black Mage is hiding. A barrier appears. She is trapped inside the house. She says, damn it, they tricked us. One of the village women is there and she says, sister. It hurts. She thinks no. Andreas is trying to break the barrier and says, it's beyond my power. Black Mage says, how pitiful. Andreas think, what? Black Mage says, just like a moth to flames. A barrier appears above the whole village. Black Magic says, there's no rush. Everything was ordained by God. Kneel in the name of Sloth. He thinks, Sloth? Why is that name appearing now? The title of the game is Great Sin Piccata. Starting with Sloth, the seven deadly sins were spit off from the main body, the Codex Apocalypse. And by collecting all of them, you can summon the last boss. He thinks, they are the most important item for the story. Why is that name mentioned here in the countryside which doesn't even appear in the main story? I can't do this by myself. I have to join up with the others for now. Vivian cuts down a lot of them. She goes mad as well. Andreas come running and says, Hazar? What happened to Vivian? Hazar says, Andreas. You are safe. This is the first time I'm seeing her like that. Andres thinks, right. I knew I couldn't trust a zealot. But leaving a wounded ally to fend for themselves, I can't say I like it. But, well, I'll play along. It's a disaster. Supervisor Ivy got trapped inside a barrier. What? Hazar says, what should we do, then? Andreas is still hearing the voice in his head saying, how pitiful. Do you realize that you are killing innocent villagers? Hazar says, this voice. It's probably the Black Mage. They're probably near Supervisor Ivy. She's in danger. I'm going over to her. I'll leave the other to you. Andreas says, he's just too obvious. I guess it's better than getting betrayed. Vivian is killing them. Andreas says, not good. Looks like the dark magic is driving her insane. If I make a wrong move, I'll get dragged in. She can't avoid that one. She stabs two of them. Andreas says, no way. He says, not only did she avoid it, she even counterattacked. Someone says, it's a shame. It couldn't be material to squander like that. Black Mage says, so what now? The only unharmed one has fled. Andreas says, I don't care. I wasn't expecting anything from him anyway. Black Mage says, you're remarkably calm. Andres says, I thought it was about time for the boss to show up. Black Mage says, I don't know where you got that confidence from, but in recognition of your bravery, I'll be giving you a test as well. Crap, I was careless. He is standing inside a void. He starts to disappear and says, what's going on? He thinks, damn it. What, was I dreaming? He is in between a modern war and thinks, where's everyone? He sees a man burning. That man says, Makoto, run. He thinks, Shohei? He runs towards him. He is Andrea's father from the game. Andrea's is really surprised to see him. The fifth part of the Necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, please subscribe and like. And if you want to support me financially, you can join my channel membership or Patreon only for $1. Patreon and Discord links are in the description if you want to support me. And a special thanks to all my Patreons for supporting me. Thanks for watching. Hello. Welcome to the sixth part of the Necromancer's Evolutionary Traits. A special thanks to my channel members for supporting me. And if you want to support, you can join my channel membership or Patreon for as low as $1. Thank you very much. Let's begin. At the beginning of this part, we see that. His father says, take it, Andreas. As long as you have it, 
you'll be recognized as the true lord of the Cromwell household. Don't be burdened by this father of yours anymore. Please, be happy together with Amy. Everything around him disappears. He thinks, I. Black Mage is surprised. The magic barrier starts to break. Andrea's hand comes out. His barrier completely breaks. Andrea is standing there. Black Mage says, You, how did you? Escape from my curse of sloth? A system window appears in front of him. He thinks, I'm fed up. System window says, Mikado Kaneshiro Andrea's Cromwell. 100% synchronization rate achieved. Makoto Kaneshiro's exceptional combat talent has been acquired. Andreas says, This curse of sloth of yours is nothing but a game that simply stimulates one's own traumas. Or should I say, that the caster's abilities are lacking? He says, What did you just say? Andreas says, Now, what are you going to do? There's no way this will work on someone like me, who has received training from the special forces. Black Mage gets angry and says, You. Shut up. And attack him. Andreas dodges the attack. He thinks, he's not that strong, but I can't end this without using my necromancy. It should be fine. No one's watching. Black Mage comes to him. He says, who the hell are you? Andreas says, I will show you right now. System says, beginner necromancy skeleton summoning. Black Mage is really surprised. System says, 23 corpses have been detected. The skill level is insufficient. Nine corpses will be activated. Beginner necromancy, skeleton summoning has been successful. Black Mage says, a necromancer. The congregation already knew? Andreas thinks, so there really is a black magic congregation. He misunderstood it, but I can use it to shake him off. Seven skeletons common. And two common skeleton soldiers have been summoned. I've been entrusted with recovering the page of sloth in the name of the congregation. With the likes of skeletons? You think you can match the power of sloth? Black Mage attacks the skeletons and destroys them. Andreas is really surprised. He activates the Earth Shield. Black Mage says, Stop pretending. Andreas says, Nickel. Black Mage says, Those are nothing but small fries. Nickel. Cuts his attacks. Black Mage is really surprised and thinks, I can't believe it. A mere skeleton cut my dark spear? This guy. Black Mage brings out something really strong. And hits the Nickel. He bring out a lot more of those. Andrea sees that and thinks, the page of sloth. To think that the likes of you is making me use my precious collected sloth power. Some really strong monster starts to come out of the ground. He says, you will pay with your life for disrupting my plans. Nickel as Andrea's barely dodges his attack. Andrea's thinks, I can react if it's only this fast. And Nickel is durable enough to withstand his attacks. Nickel is blocking all his attacks. Black Mage says, die quietly. Andreas is dodging his attacks and thinks, the attacks have gotten even faster. He's having trouble controlling his strength. That means he still didn't fully master the power of sloth. Go for his blind spot and strike him. Nickel. Nickel disappears. Black Mage sees Andreas and thinks, he's a persistent one. Andreas says, you bastard. He was someone I just got my hands on. Black Mage says, my bad, but don't worry. I'll send you to the same place where the skeleton is now. Farewell. Nickel appears behind Black Mage through a portal. Nickel cuts Black Mage into two pieces. Andreas thinks, I thought about who could be the one doing this. But to think that the Baron Butler was a Black Mage, that means that somehow the Baron is involved with this as well. Anyways, Andreas picks up the page of Sloth. System says, Apocalypse Codex 7th Chapter Diligent Sloth Mana Recovery Rate 321%. Andreas thinks, what should I do with this? It's not like I can just walk around with it. That's right, there's also Nickel. He gives the page of sloth to Nickel and says, Take care of this for now. Let's put it first in the summoning storage, and then think about what to do with it later. Even though the caster died, so why isn't the barrier disappearing? It's fine for me if they don't manage to come out. But then I'd have to explain to survive if I came back alone. This barrier is different from the one I was in. Andreas touches the barrier. He gets sucked into the barrier. Andreas is in Vivian's dream, he says. Is this little one Vivian Belcan? She says, a ghost? Or is it a demon? The chair is talking? Andreas says, I am neither a ghost nor a demon, Vivian. I am a fairy who came to rescue you. Andreas thinks, it's nice that I came here, but what the hell am I doing? Be patient. This is all an act. I'm a fairy. The first thing I saw when I came here was the young Vivian being slapped in the face by some noble woman. 
because nobody can see me, investigating was really easy. So I found out that woman was Count Belkin's second wife, as well as this household's background. The Belkin household is famous for its swordsmanship, so the Lord wanted a son that could become its successor. However, because Vivian mother didn't give birth to a male heir, a tragedy began. Why did I have you? I should have never given birth to you. Since even her own mother had abandoned her, there wasn't a single person left to protect Vivian. Because of the loneliness and mistreatment she was suffering, a seed of insanity was planted. And as the time passed, the more she succumbed to the insanity. To the point she killed all of the teachers and assistant teachers in the fifth year meeting by herself. She says, Mr. Fairy? Andreas thinks, I can't make you forget your past. But I can give you a hand in trying to overcome it. She starts to cry and says, Did you really come to help me? He says, Why are you crying, Vivian? She says, I haven't had anyone try to help me before. Andreas thinks, I really don't know how to deal with kids. He says, You have a special talent, Vivian. It's just that nobody here has recognized it yet. She says, I am special. He says, Yes. You have a very special and excellent talent for swordsmanship, but I haven't even touched a sword yet. This fairy here knows a lot of things, so just trust me. She says, but I am always getting scolded. He says, it's fine. I will be by your side. And in exchange, promise me that you won't tell anyone about me. She says, I promise. After that, Andreas stays with her. Teach her swordsmanship and other stuff. When she gets sick, he sits by her side. One month later, Vivian is calling him saying, where are you, Mr. Fairy? I came to the promised location just like you told me. She says, are you going to be teaching me swordsmanship today too? Andreas says, you can't go around screaming about it, Vivian. I said that nobody can find out about my real identity. She says, so you were over there. He sees us. Then, let's start the training. And just like that, I spent a whole month here with Vivian. Vivian is training. He thinks, with my exceptional grade combat talent, I tried to give as much advice as I could to her. It synergized really well with her. She is truly a genuine prodigy. Those shouldn't be the movements of a brat that has only been learning swordsmanship for a month. Andreas says, that's why you've been getting praised by your swordsmanship instructor. She says, but... Andreas says, what is this? I thought she was a pretty confident kid. What's wrong, Vivian? Your movements were perfect. No matter how much I get praised by my teacher. Mr. Fairy won't show himself to me. That's... Andreas says, I'm a fairy. That's why, haven't I told you? She says, is it because I'm a bad child, so you won't show yourself to me? I thought that if I did my best and got acknowledged. But, even though, I tried so hard. You still haven't shown yourself to me. She says, it's useless no matter how hard I try, isn't it? Someone comes there and says, you've surprised me, Vivian. Count Belkan? Count Belkan says, to think that you have such talent. He says, show me, that swordsmanship once more. She is really surprised and she says, Yes, sir. She shows it again. Count Belkin says, as expected of one with Belkin's blood. That was incredible. Belkin leaves. She says, Mr. Fairy. That was the first time my Tahir has ever praised me. To think that even I could dream of such a thing. She says, I really want to stay with Mr. Fairy more, but... The time for me to wake up has come. Andreas thinks. So, she finally woke up. Because of you, I found the path to go forward. She says, I think I should follow this path and not stay stuck in the past. He says, Vivian Belkan, our promise. Please keep it. She says, I will, forever. Thank you so much, Mr. Fairy. She says, you showed me a good dream. He says, if it's Vivian, she can do it. The barrier breaks and Vivian is on the ground. He thinks, especially if it's the same Vivian from the dream. Baron Balaric is the one behind the incident in Thrym Village. Ivy learned of this fact after breaking the barrier on her own and joining up with us. Ivy says, Hey, big head, cut this bastard's head off and try not to scar his face. We're going to the Baron's castle right now. We started moving immediately. Her killing intent is terrifying. Christopher is dead and Hazar is missing. No surprise there. Ivy is hitting the guards. They says, Who are you? She says, Put your swords away. Ivy says, I'm Ivy Claire. Assistant Professor of Rodlin Academy's Knight Faculty. From this moment on, anyone who defends Baron Balaric is guilty of treason and will be executed immediately. 
Andreas thinks, she's not going to just kill them all, is she? She is holding Black Mage's head. She says, recognize him? He's the one responsible for what happened in the village of Thrym. Take us to the Baron immediately. He says, you're here. So, Evan is dead. This is my son, Edel. He should have died of illness a few months ago. Andreas says, I see, so that's why he dabbled in black magic. He says, while I was looking around for medicine, a robed man visited me. He said he had a way to help my son. He says, I asked him to do whatever it took to save my son's life. Even if that meant leaving him in this miserable state. He says, Edel, please forgive your foolish father. Ivy says, those words. Say them to the people you and your butler have killed. She threw him. Guard says, my lord. Ivy says, why are Yoan just standing around there like a fool? Go call the investigation team right now. And get rid of that monster in the back. Andreas uses a rock spear. Vivian sees him. He screams. Ivy and Vivian are confused. She says, Oi, big head. Why did you do that without my orders? Andreas says, A creature born of black magic should be dealt with immediately, before it makes any sudden moves. Besides, any important information must be in the Baron's hands. Am I wrong? Afterwards, the Baron was arrested and immediately taken away by the Imperial Investigation Team. When we returned to the Academy, Vivian and I were also called in to give our testimony. It is clear that there was colluding with a black mage. They says, bring the Baron. We'll hold another hearing. Thank you for your time. You two can go home now. He thinks, Baron Balaric, the consequences of getting involved with black magic will surely be severe. Andreas thinks, but you should be thanking me. If I hadn't killed your son, he would have suffered the hell of being experimented on by a bunch of insane wizards. Vivian says, Mr. Fairy must have figured it all out, right? About the Baron's son. She says, you didn't want five to let him live to suffer, did you? Andrea says, Fairy? What are you talking about? I almost spoke like a fairy. She says, but you sound just like him. Lucia comes running and says, Senior Andreas, are you done with your business? Andrea says, yeah, they said the hearing's over. She says, well, anyway, check this out. Senior. You're famous. She says, it's only been a short time since we unveiled the potion. Andrea says, for real, even though all I want is some peace and quiet. Lucia says, right? I heard you're getting a reward. Treat me to a meal, please. Andrea says, no, the reward money has to be split. She says, isn't she the one who's on the news along with you, senior? Andrea says, and you only noticed her now? She's Vivian Belcan, a third year, night faculty student greet her. She greets her. She says, back to the story. You're the one getting the money anyway, aren't you? So let's go out to dinner and celebrate the success of our potion production. But the jury's not out yet. We'll have dinner some other time. She says, all right. Anyway, I'll see you at the magic tower tomorrow. Andrea says, yeah, I won't forgive you if you're late. After that, we see at Rodlin magic tower. And Dyers is holding Lucia and says, I knew it would end up like this. I was a fool to trust you. A man at the tower says, Andreas Cromwell and Lucia Everlast, correct? Andreas says, yes. He says, follow me. He says, the space in the magic tower is constantly changing, so please watch your step. You hear that? Now, wake up and walk properly. Lucia says, I'm awake. So, Vivian, the senior I met yesterday, what is your relationship with her? Andreas says, nothing in particular? She says, oh well but we should definitely go out for dinner. Andreas says, you're rich. Why do you keep begging me to treat you? Someone says, I see you two are not nervous at all. How cheeky. He thinks, that voice, it can't be. The owner of the Rodlin Magic Tower? Brack Alvin? Cromwell Scroll of Information Great Sins World Outlook. Magic Tower is a group of engineering wizards who contribute to civilization. It started with the Amon Levitation. A group of engineering wizards who contribute to civilization. It started with the mana levitation. Trained, but they developed various products, such as mana lamps and fertilizers. The more famous a magic tower is, the more famous a magic tower is, the more money it receives from the government and nobility. The sixth part of the necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, please subscribe and like. And if you want to support me financially, you can join my channel membership or Patreon only for $1. Channel membership joining link and Discord links are in the description if you want to support me.
And a special thanks to all my channel members for supporting me. Thanks for watching. Hello. Welcome to the seventh part of the Necromancer's Evolutionary Traits. A special thanks to my channel members for supporting me. And if you want to support, you can join my channel membership or Patreon for as low as $1. Thank you very much. Let's begin. At the beginning of this part, we see that Tower Master appears in front of them. He sees Andreas and says, his son, really has that unchanging stupid face. Andreas thinks, Bark Alvin, head of the Alvin household and the current master of the Rodlin Magic Tower. Isn't the Tower Master blowing thing out of proportion by appearing personally? Tower Master says, and you are Viscount Hollington's daughter, I presume? Lucia says, yes, my name is Lucia Everlast. He says, if you want people to remember your name, you have to build a reputation to match. Andreas is really surprised and thinks, we heard you. Tower Master says, from now on, I will be the one in charge of this. Stand back. A really big magic circle appears under them. Lukisa says, this Tower Master really is a monster, being able to use such difficult and complex space magic, but it feels like he's exaggerating on purpose. Tower Master says, I can also hear you, you whippersnappers. They appears in front of some judges. They are really surprised to see him. And says, Tower Master. He says, is the potion examination still going on? They say, yes, we just finished the efficacy examination. All that's left is to ask some questions about the production method. Tower Master drinks the potion. He says, Mohem leaves, Tador tree essence, Jahaz fruit, and Piona mushroom. Is there anything else in there? Lucia says, Hong Pishi extract and Matarata root bark. He says, interesting. Judges says, I heard the rumors, but to think she could make such potions at her age. Tower Master says, since the examination is now over, approve it. Tower Master say, but why is Cromwell's son here? On paper this was reported as a joint effort, but he just got carried, didn't he? Lucia says, without him, I wouldn't have been able to create the potion. Tower Master says, you wouldn't? She says, that's right. Most of the work was done by him. I only helped out. Tower Master says, fine. I will verify this now. Lucia says, it seems like he can't use this magic outside of the magic tower. Andrea says, she's analyzing it even now. They get to the research facility. He says, make the potion right here. The ingredients are in the storage. Andrea says, understood. Andrea thinks, if I use something I didn't use before, there could be a problem. So, let's go with this one. Five minutes later. Tower Master tests the potions and says, I'll acknowledge that you created the potion correctly. Now, let's start with the questions. Why did you use Hong Pishi? Andreas says, well, I used it to get rid of the side effects and to improve its efficiency. Lucia thinks, so, Senior Seaweed can explain it well, too. Tower Master says, I understand you needn't go on. Andreas says, I didn't finish explaining it, though. Tower Master removes his blindfold and says, even though we haven't seen each other for quite a long time. The brat I knew couldn't have made something like this. He looks at him and says, Who are you? Tower Master Sazi, are you joking, Sir Alvin? I am definitely Andreas Cromwell. The same Andreas you treated like a bug and made fun out of it all the time. Master says, You have become quite the interesting lad, haven't you? All right, let's make a bet. If you discover another medicine this year and bring it here, I will pay off all of the Cromwell family debt. And... I will grant you one wish. However, if you fail, you will have to leave Rodlin's academy. Well, what do you think of it? Andreas thinks the conditions are harsh, but... Andreas says, I will accept this bet. As the heir of the Cromwell family, I cannot possibly refuse such an offer. Tower Master says, let's hope you actually produce results, seeing that you are so confident. Tower Master thinks of them when they were kids. He says, I'll be looking forward to it. Remaining this is decreasing. The vampire gets up. She easily breaks the cage. She thinks of Andrea saying, however, you will have to swear on your family name. That you won't kill me. She smiles and says, Andreas. Cromwell Scroll of Information, Great Sins World Outlook. Stormbringer, a spiritual monster with high intellect. Can control lightning and wind even in the game. Having one as your pet was an incredibly difficult task. Andreas thinks, I got back some of the material costs, so my need for money has decreased a bit. As long as I keep making potions, I'll be able to solely focus on my training. The problem right now is the Page of Sloth. No matter how much I think about it, I can't find a way to benefit from it. I should probably exchange it for something I need right now. It can't be helped. 
I'll have to use Sharon. He gets back to the academy. He alone someone is watching him from above a tree. Am I imagining things? Vampire is watching him. Andrea's meet with Sharon. Sharon says, the hot topic of the academy is finally visiting me. Is this the potion? Andrea says, yes, I came to report to you right after the final examination ended. You've been researching it in secret from me, and now you're acting like a real disciple. I wasn't. Planning to master. Sharon says, shut up. Now come here without complaining. I'll engrave into you what it means to be my disciple. Andreas thinks he's holding a grudge because of something so trivial. How stingy. Looks like I can't bring the topic up today. Talking to him while he's in a bad mood is a no-go. I should be satisfied with just checking the vampire's condition. His hole is lit on fire. Andreas thinks, seems like the evolution was a success. It's a pity we won't be able to meet her anymore. She was a nice sample. Sharon is really angry, he says. Andreas. Andreas says, yes? He says, did you do something to Angela's restraints? Andreas says, no. I was scared for my life. Andreas thinks, what an idiot. Even though she was just a hybrid. Servers, you're right. Sharon gets really angry. Andreas thinks, I'll bring up the page of sloth another day. Vampire gets there and says, Andreas. Andreas thinks, she was waiting to ambush me. She says, I've had something to ask you ever since I woke up care to answer? She says, look at me. Andreas. Good, child. Now tell me. About the power I got. Andreas says, why are you doing this? Didn't I keep my word? You should know the price of breaking the oath of your family name. She says, I know it all too well. But, I can't help but to ask you something. I couldn't break free front he restraints with my own strength, no matter how much I tried. So I used another way. Do you know what it is? What was the amazing method I used? She thinks, why is this guy giving off that smell? It's just like the great sin of. She says, I finally see what it is. How interesting. Andre says, what the hell are you saying? She grabs him through the neck and says, there are lots of things I want to ask you. But since this place is too noticeable, I'll stop for now. Since we'll be meeting again pretty soon. For the time being, I'll be putting this power to good use. And since you helped me, I can't help but want to thank you. Andreas thinks, what is this strength? She says, don't worry. I won't make you suffer. Since you may be my fated partner. Cromwell Information Scroll. Great Sin World Overview. Drop Materials. When the Great Sin was imply a game, only useful items dropped, however. Since the game has now turned into reality, I have to deal with the Ross material myself, and that makes the processing and mixing much more difficult. The seventh part of the Necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, please subscribe and like. And if you want to support me financially, you can join my channel membership or Patreon only for $1. Patreon and Discord links are in the description if you want to support me. And a special thanks to all my Patreons for supporting me. Thanks for watching. Hello. Welcome to the eighth part of the Necromancer's evolutionary traits. At the beginning of this part, we see that, at a delusion dormitory, Dain says, and then, Lord Philip, with his one handed sword. Julek says, Dain. Stop your preaching just for a little bit. She says, Julik, if you look hard enough, even you can find a knight to root for. By the way, did you hear? It appears Lucia Everlast passed the Magic Tower Potion examination. She says, wow, at that age? I heard she was lazy, but it looks like she s the real deal. But the really surprising part was this. Look, can you believe it? Andreas Cromwell. To think someone as untalented as him managed to help create this potion. When I first heard, I thought it was a lie, too. After his family's downfall, he could only blame his circumstances and talent. What did you accomplish on your own? He said. Did he, that trash, really change? I'll have to confirm this myself. After that we see in the class. Lucia says, Senior, why are you wearing so many clothes? Andrea says, I'm not feeling well. Lucia says, then why are you here instead of resting? Andreas says, I need to attend enough classes to graduate. Andreas thinks, last night, I can't let anyone see this huge scar on my neck. She said something about a faded partner and some smell. What the hell was she talking about? She just bit my neck all of a sudden and disappeared. Professor says, is everyone here? Student says, yes. Then, let us start the lecture right away. Professor says, Andreas Cromwell. Why are you wearing so many clothes? Are you sick? Andreas says, yes. 
I caught a cold. Professor says, you seem to be tired because of your potion research. I already marked you as present, so you may leave. Andreas says, thank you very much. But, it feels quite lonely here. You even asked me, a professor of medicinal botany, for advice. Perhaps it was too difficult to include my name? Andreas thinks, what is he saying? You didn't contribute anything, and you want a piece of it? Andreas says, I am really grateful for the advice you gave me, teacher. Especially the one regarding the Hong Pishi extract and the Matarata tree bark. Lucia thinks, is he picking a fight? Andreas says, you said that if I added those, I'd be making soup instead of a potion. But, as you can see, the soup was just too good. Everyone is really surprised. Professor says, you are overstepping your boundaries. Andreas says, since I'm not feeling well, I'll be leaving. Professor shouts and says, Andreas Cromwell. Andreas thinks, when I was just a small fry, you guys kept ridiculing me, but now you want to be friendly? Andreas thinks, just shut up and lick my boots. I can just go to another class if I need credits. Professor says, how long are you going to ignore me? Lucia says, Professor. Professor says, Lucia Everlast? Lucia says, can I explain it on his behalf as someone who co-created the potion? Andreas thinks, what the hell are you thinking? Professor says, go ahead. Lucia says, we learned the basics about making potion in this class. And then, we put those basics to practice. So our conclusion is, that doing your own research without anyone's help means a lot. I mean, isn't that our duty as magicians? Professor says, that's right. Andreas thinks, Vauban is being overwhelmed by Lucia. Lucia says, we'll ask for your advice next time. If you aren't occupied enough doing your own research. Vauban says, you can always come for my advice. And you, take care. Get back safely. Andreas thinks, Lucia, you did really well, de-escalating the situation. I still don't know why, but thank you. He says, reporting about the potentially scoutable candidates. First, I will report about the students already enrolled in Rodland's Academy. Someone is ready a report. He is Wu Angwa officer or master Duke Sinclair Cloche. Sinclair Cloche says, so, the Everlast Company's daughter created a new type of potion, and they're making it available commercially? His assistant says, correct. They name it the Everlast Potion and are currently monopolizing its sales. Sinclair says, do you have a sample? His assistant says, yes, sir. Sinclair says, is she already made this while only being a first-year student? Surely many people will try to recruit when she graduates. His assistant says, that is why we need to connect with her now. Sinclair says, also check if there are any other who have got their eyes on here. His assistant says, so, how is it? He says, it surprised me. If they manage to commercialize this, it will revolutionize the market. It's several times more efficient than the one currently available on the market, and there's no side effects. However, there is another thing worth taking note of, Your Excellency. The report stated that the potion was co-create. Kane Cromwell's sewn? Huh? Did he have a talent for potion making from the beginning? She says, it doesn't seem like it. There is also a rumor circulating, saying that he took advantage of her. But then, would there be any reason for her to add his name? No. And since neither household holds any particular relationship to the other, Sinclair says, then, let's investigate it. If it appears he's awakened a talent, add him to the scouting list. She says, understood. After that, someone says, how's the end of year award ceremony going? Just as planned, your majesty. The Cromwell family will be demoted. Andrea's Cromwell. I look forward to seeing if you are different from your father. Andrea's is swinging his sword. It's 9,999 time. He's done 10,000. Andreas drinks the potion he made and thinks, without these, it'd be impossible for me to do this. The regeneration potion increases the recovery rate of my muscles, while the healing potion takes care of my fatigue. And by adding the physical reinforcement potion, I've basically created a system to train infinitely. Andreas says, it was a gamble, but evolving you was the right choice. He thinks, I stressed about it a lot at first, but after some time I decided to evolve it anyway, since the risk was low enough. Andrea's Cromwell, Potion Creation Buff Type Evolution. Chance of Success, 89% Attempt Evolution. Andrea's Cromwell, 
you have successfully evolved the Potion Creation Buff Type. Talent, Potion Creation Buff Type Ordinary has evolved into Potion Creation Buff Type Extraordinary. He thinks, the results were so amazing that I felt like an idiot for even worrying about it. I can create way more potions now, the success rate has increased substantially as well. As long as everything keeps going this way and I do my best, I'll be able to grow well. Andreas says, and if I can get a good corpse and some items, I won't need to worry about my fighting strength. And, since Sharon is always away, I can't sell the page of sloth to him right away. Andreas see a note on the board. Away due to an urgent business trip. Sharon Diprin. Andreas thinks, is he in such a bad mood that he went traveling and couldn't even let his disciple know? Why is he so petty? He says, I have no other connections besides him. I have medicinal botany classes tomorrow morning. So let's stop worrying and go to sleep. After that, Andreas sees a note on the board in the class, saying, For the reasons mentioned above, today's class will be taught outdoors, as was notified via your table. Vauban. Andreas says, Shit. That Vauban bastard. Andreas thinks, Did you know I don't have a tablet and is he using it to get to me? What the hell is he thinking of doing with the students? Rodlin Academy Garden. Everyone is in tension. He says, What? Why is everyone hurrying so much? It looks like an exam somehow. You're late. Andreas Cromwell. Professor says, Seems like you were so busy with your own research that you didn't see the notice. Andreas says, How immature can a person be? Lucia says, Anyway, come here. I'll explain it to you. Just buy a tablet at this point. You have money now, don't you? So, he discovered an awakening potion and came up with the idea to make an exam to analyze it just like that? Andreas thinks, he must have felt the need to brag about it. Professor says, for someone of your caliber, figuring out the ingredients and proportions of this potion must be a breeze, right? Andreas thinks, you really are one obstinate. Professor thinks, there's no need to be ashamed. You have a very bright future ahead of you. Professor says, today, I'll finally expose you for what you are. He thinks, someone who just took advantage of Miss Everlast, the rising star of the potion world. You are nothing more than a trash student. After that we see four hours later. Awakening Potions Composition Analysis Test Results 1. Lucia Everlast 1 hour 22 minutes 16 seconds 100% 2. Andreas Cromwell 2 hours 4 minutes 33 seconds 100% 3. Talon Bugman 3 hours 23 minutes 1 seconds 96% They says there was no cheating of any kind during the exam. So the Andreas really do have a talent for making potions. Lucia says, good job, senior seaweed. Andreas, I'm not a seaweed. My name is Andreas. Professor Vauban, why did you do this to me? Professor says, you are. Why did you claim the potion I made as your own? Andreas thinks, why? The eighth part of the necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, please subscribe and like. And if you want to support me financially, you can join my channel membership or Patreon only for $1. Patreon and Discord links are in the description if you want to support me. And a special thanks to all my Patreons for supporting me. Thanks for watching. Hello. Welcome to the ninth part of the Necromancer's evolutionary traits. At the beginning of this part, we see that the boy says, How could you do this to me? You more than anyone else, should know how much effort I put into this. Student says, isn't Senior Giralf mistaken? I never expected a teacher to be the type to. Andreas says, what do you think? Lucia says, if it's Professor Vauban, I think he probably did it. Andreas says, I was thinking the same thing. Lucia says, hold on, where are you going? She thinks, and I even saved him yesterday. Well, I won't care about you anymore, you stupid. Stubborn seaweed. Andreas says, Professor, I have a question related to the ingredients of the potion. Professor says, Andreas, can't you see that this isn't a good time? Andreas says, but, it's related to this situation. If this is your own work, you should be able to prove that you made it right here, right now, right? Professor gets scared and thinks this. His student says, proving he made it. You mean like the magic tower examination? Andreas says, if you truly made the potion, you should be able to explain why you used which materials easily. 
Or perhaps, you're not confident enough. Professor says, not confident. You say? How cheeky. I am a professor at the prestigious Rodlin Academy. Andreas says, then, answers this question. Why did you change the upriver resin to cytomine petals? Professor gets scared and thinks. I was so distracted by the presentation day that I forgot to check that part. Student says, why aren't you answering right away? Because, by using the petals, we can cut costs. If you were the one developing it, you would have known. I see. Now, about the proportions. What the hell do you think you're doing? Only the magic towers can perform potion examinations. Last question. Why did you use the more expensive jelly beetle instead of papina powder? Other students say, why isn't the professor answering? Did he really steal it? To think he would claim the research of his student as his own. That is because, professor says, papica powder has a hallucinogenic effect. That's why I used beetles instead, even though they are more costly. Student says, professor, that's not why I didn't use the powder. The reason was that the powder gets heated for a long time while the potion is being made which can give the one who consumes it a stomachache. Professor says, you are wrong. It's definitely because of the hallucinogenic effect. Student says, about that, I just remembered something. You did tell me the powder had side effects, but you didn't tell me it was a hallucinogen. So could you please explain how you came up with that answer? Have you got no shame as a scientist? To think that you would go as far to steal credits from your disciple. Resign right now. They are the scammers. You two set this up, didn't you? I will report both of you to the disciplinary committee. Andreas says, he's really reached rock bottom. When a child throws a tantrum, there's no choice but to leave it to the adults. If you're so annoyed, I can ask Sir Alvin to set up a place for you to explain it to him. Andreas says, it should be possible. Since I am being sponsored by him. Lucia thinks, wow. He's using the card to buy materials to threaten him. Maybe he'll fall for it. Andreas says, what's wrong? Don't you want to explain yourself? That Bart? An eagle is watching them. He thinks, this Vauban guy. Since he's caused such a commotion, he'll have to pay for it. He thinks, but that brat really did his research, didn't he? He knew the theory and the ingredients behind the awakening potion. It really might be possible for him to discover a new medicine before the year ends. I'll be looking forward to it, Kane's son. After that we see at the academy cafeteria. Lucia thinks, he actually invited me to eat together, but to think it would be in the academy's cafeteria. Andreas says, aren't you going to eat? It's so good. She says, I will. She touches the food and it is really hot. Andreas says, you should do it like this, rich lady. Grab it at the edge like this, then drown it in sauce. Lucia says, it doesn't matter that I'm rich. She thinks, to think that you could. He thinks, also enjoys eating in the cafeteria. Vivian says, me too. That. Here, take it. Lucia says, by the way, senior, when are you going to buy your tablet? If you have one, you'd be notified if an event like the one today were to happen again, and you wouldn't miss it. Isn't that useful? Andreas says, but I'm saving money right now. Lucia says, it's not even that expensive in the first place. Vivian thinks, Mr. Fairy gave me meat. Andrea says, nothing is expensive for a rich lady like you. Lucia says, hey, seaweed. Vivian says, do you also want my reward, Mr. Fairy? Andrea says, no need. By the way, why are you even calling me Mr. Fairy? Andrea says, I'll be going now. Lucia says, what the hell, didn't we just eat? Well, see you later then. Andrea says, bye, see you later too, Vivian. Sharon. Andrea thinks. He finally came back. Andrea says, It seems that you have returned from your trip, master. Sharon says, Come to my lab at noon tomorrow. Andrea says, Understood. He thinks, Just in time. After that we see at the Rodlin Academy Alvin Street. World Hammer Handlings. Andrea buys a sword and thinks, He's the type of guy that thinks that everything I have is his, so I don't doubt that he will try to take the page of sloth from me by force. So it's better if I also have this. Andreas says, this one, please. Dyne appears there and says, Andreas? Dyne says, what are you doing at a blacksmith? Andreas says, I needed a sword. Dyne says, a sword? But aren't you a mage? Andreas says, 
it's good to have at least one for self-defense. This? It's a present for my ogre of a brother. Andreas thinks, brother does she mean Carlos Alvin? Carlos Alvin is the Alvin household's oldest son. He left to train to become a warrior. We got along pretty well before. Carlos had already died when the game started, so the game just glossed over him. If I'm not mistaken, he died at the Academy's end-of-year event. After Hazar escaped from the Duke Balarik's territory, he joined a religious cult. The Zephyro cult, the same cult that did the terrorist attack. Andreas says, is Carlos also participating in the end-of-year event? Dine says, yes. Andreas says, it would be nice if we could meet again, just the three of us. Dine says, is that so? She thinks, after hearing what everyone had been saying about him, I'm not sure that he's somehow changed. Dine thinks, how should I ask him? Don't worry, I'll just ask him normally. Andreas says, is there something you want to say? Well then, see you later. Dine says, I want to know why. Andreas thinks, after thinking about Carlos for a bit, there's still time until the terrorist incident occurs. After that we see at the academy teaching department. Sharon says, I've been searching the whole continent for a material of the same quality as Angela, but so far I haven't been able to find one. Sharon says, so, I intend to keep searching a little longer. My hopes aren't high, but I need it for the congregation this weekend. Andreas thinks, this is where the game begins. If he gets blinded by greed and asks me to give it to him, I win. Andreas says, we are going to be busy for the time being so brace yourself. Master, I'd like to talk to you about something. Sharon says, what is it? Andreas says, I managed to get the Apocalypse Codex. Sharon says, don't say such stupid things. That is not something the likes of you could get their hands on. Andreas says, this is not something I can handle. He brings out Sloth and says, so. Andreas says, I want you to have it. Sharon says, you keep it. This is a highly sought after item. So keeping it would only spell trouble. Take it to the congregation. So we can exchange it for another item. Andreas thinks, that's what I thought you'd say. Given that you're the type to prioritize your own life over anything else. Sharon says, since we have to go to the congregation this weekend, clear your schedule and prepare yourself. He says, understood, master. He thinks, eastern edge of the city, the confinement zone forest of captivity adjacent area. Andreas says, I made it through Sharon in one piece, but now the problem is going to the congregation. There are many dangerous individuals there, and words won't get through to them, so I'll have to negotiate as safely as possible. Sharon says, I'll be able to trade the page of sloth for items that will help me grow. I will take anything I can get for it. Andreas thinks, he's completely sure that the page of sloth is already his. But when push comes to shove, he'll be using me as a shield. Their carriage suddenly stops. Someone says, hey, you guys are going to the congregation, right? Mind if I ride along with you? Andreas thinks, that's... That man says, thank God. He thinks, Salem Edidia, one of the continent's greatest tin. He is even willing to deal with the forbidden for the sake of exploring, which is why he became known as the devil in pursuit of the truth. Andreas thinks, if the information about the page of sloth got leaked, the situation may not turn out as well. What's with that expression? Oi. Are you dissatisfied since I'm going to the congregation? Not at all, Sir Salem. He starts to laugh and says, Don't worry, boy. I've already gone there several times. Andreas says, I knew he was insane, but to think he would go this far. He says, By the way, boy, what's your name? Introduce yourself. He's your senior, Salem Edidia. Andreas tells him his name. He is surprised and says, Oh my God, so you've gotten your hands on another Cromwell? Andreas thinks, What is he talking about? He's saying it in a way that suggests there's some kind of secret about the Cromwell family. He says, Looks like the kid doesn't know anything. Well then, how about I give you one special piece of advice? Struggle as much as possible. Andreas thinks, His face tells me I shouldn't ask anything about it. What the hell is Sharon hiding from me? They suddenly stop again. He says, what do you want? If you have something to talk about, do it in person, Dragon. Someone appears in front of their carriage. Sorry about that. He says, it's been a long time, Sharon Diprin. The ninth part of the necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, please subscribe and like.
And if you want to support me financially, you can join my channel membership or Patreon only for $1. Patreon and Discord links are in the description if you want to support me. And a special thanks to all my Patreons for supporting me. Thanks for watching. Hello. Welcome to the 10th part of the Necromancer's Evolutionary Traits. At the beginning of this part we see that, they say, to think that you would be together with Senior Salem. Can you shut up? Your breath stinks. Andreas thinks, Deep Sea Dragon. He was probably trying to steal the Page of Sloth, but didn't expect us to be with Salem. Look over there. There is a really big treehouse. Sir Morshi has noticed that we have arrived, and is showing us the path to the congregation. Why did he have to pick a place so high up? It's just as I expected. It seems there are some pretty greedy black mages here. Are they stupid? Trying to steal the codex while Salem is here? Now then, let's see how many black mages there are. He uses a really strong detection magic. There are a lot of black mages hiding on the trees. He says, I see. There's only about seven of you? Well, we're done playing hide and seek. Assassin says, shit. We have been found. Everyone retreat. He says, found you. They are a lot of black mages. Sitting in the treehouse. He gets to the treehouse and says, Hey, Morshi. Long time no see. It's been a while, Morshi, Jester. Morshi says, Even you came, Salem. Salem says, No need to be so cold. It's thanks to me that the page of sloth is safe and sound. Hey, boy. Open the bag. Now, take a look. Morshi says, this is an emergency meeting where there's not many of us. And you still committed such an unnecessary murder? Andreas thinks, those were all intermediary and up black mages who were pretty annoying to deal with in the game. And he managed to deal with them by just releasing his magic power. Salem Edidia is truly a force to be reckoned with. Salem says, without me here, you wouldn't even be able to get a glimpse of the sloth. Morshi says, anyway. Enough about the small fry, hurry up and show me the page of sloth. Salem says, this Andreas Cromwell brat is quite interesting. He didn't even flinch after witnessing that massacre. And he didn't hesitate when I told him to cut off their necks. What's more? He has a dual core just like me. Andreas says, what the hell are you doing? Salem says, I've taken a liking to you boy. Andreas thinks, was Salem gay in the game? He says, what do you think you're doing, Salem? Morshi says, let's stop with the jokes right there. Salem says, I'll definitely help you out someday, but just once. See it as a favor, since I have some affinity with the Cromwell family. Andreas thinks, he promised? Salem is someone who never breaks his promises. There were numerous times in the game where he kept his promise, no matter what. If I have his help, shouldn't I change my plans a little? Morshi says, it truly is the real diligent sloth, there, no doubt about it. Sharon thinks, when did Andreas summon him? Salem says, you entrusted the codex to a skeleton? Andreas says, yes. Salem says, it must be pretty durable then, huh? Andreas says, calm down. We don't want to take any chances with those monsters. I can't hesitate, not even once. Andreas says, go back Nickel. Skeleton disappears. Andreas brings out the sword to stab himself. Morshi says, what are you doing? Karen's disciple? Andreas says, I was the on who found the page of sloth, so I want my efforts to be recognized. Appropriately. Marsh says, you went mad with greed. Morshi. Andreas says, the page of sloth is in my storage, along with my skeleton. So, if I were to die, you would never be able to get your hands on the codex? Andreas says, Salem. Salem says, didn't you say you would help me out one time? Now's the time. Hurry up. I don't have much time. Salem said. You're acting this reckless just because of something I said? What if I tricked you? What would you do then? Andreas says, I'd do the best I can do. Even if that means I'm going to die to survive in this crazy world. I am willing to become crazy myself. Salem says, you really are a funny guy. I did tell you to struggle, but I didn't expect you to go this far. Salem uses. Sinister l'ancivel serpent. If you insist, then I have no choice but to kill them all. Salem says, from now on, anyone who tries to touch Cromwell will be killed. They say, we won't touch him, Salem said, and if anyone dares to question this later, I'll find you and kill you. 
Marsh says, you're really going to fight us over a kid like that? Are you serious? Salem says, you know what I'm like. I wouldn't tell a lie like this. They say, are you kidding me, Salem? He says, God damn it. Do I have to repeat myself again? Everyone gets really scared. One of them says, excited. Marsh says, it can't be helped. What is it you want, Karen's disciple? Andreas says, thank you for waiting. Marsh says, tell us what you want. He says, could you please tell me what I can get for it? Marsh, how ridiculous. You don't even know what you want. Take five from this list. Choose carefully. I reckon there are corpses on here, too. Corpses, huh? Andreas says, it's the congregation. So they must have some good corpses. The former fairy queen, Mylene, and the tiger king, Timer. He thinks, they're first class material. I must get them. They says, Jester. Those corpses have already been sold to Morn. If you give them to him, Morn will be furious. Andreas thinks, Morn. Are they saying those corpses have been bought by the leading figure of necromancy? If I mess with him, things will get problematic. I have to give up. Morn say, I do not mind. Take it. How generous. Sharon says, Andreas. Doesn't have the ability to handle those corpses yet. I said I do not mind, Sharon. You there. The corpses are in my subspace bag. Take the whole bag with you. He thinks, I have no idea why Morn is being so generous, but I can't let this opportunity pass. Andreas says, I'm grateful for your generosity, sir. Now then, I will select the rest of the items, including the corpses. Sharon says, damn it, I should have brought the page of sloth here by myself. Take it, there are a lot of stuff. Salem says, kid, there are better things in there. Are you sure you want those? Andreas says, for me, these are very valuable. He thinks, I can make a total of four patients with these, but they're worth several hundred million wills. I also ended up picking out ingredients for Lucia's cure. Marsh says, now, hand over the page of sloth. Andreas gives off the page of sloth. Salem says, get ready to go. Salem grabs Andreas and starts to run away. They after them. Andreas says, they were planning to get rid of me once I gave them the page of sloth, right? Salem says, a promise is a promise. I'll take you to a safe place. Andreas says, I would like to go back to the academy. Please take me to the nearest train station. The academy. Rodlin. He says, yes. Does Bart know you're a black mage? If he did, I wouldn't be alive, would I? Salem says, fate is a curious thing, isn't it? Well, you'll figure it out when the time comes. Andreas says, what on earth are you talking about? He says, as I told you on the way here. Just keep struggling, that's all. As long as you can survive, then you'll find out who you are. Andreas brings out Timer's corpse and says, to think that something this big coot fit into it. The subspace bag is really handy. I had no choice but to summon Nickel as a skeleton. But for these two, it would be better to increase my necromancy levels and turn them into high-level summons. I'll keep them in there for now. He puts them back into the subspace. Andreas says, and now, he sees a book. System says, Morn's Black Magic Tome, a high-level skill book written personally by Morn. Andreas thinks, a gift from Morn? It contains a lot of knowledge that I couldn't get at Karen's library. If I read this, I'll be able to turn the corpses I got today into high-level summons. Won't I? What now? System says, Skeleton Soldier Legendary's Evolution Probability, 100%. There are 66 possible divergences of evolution. Do you want to evolve? He thinks, I was wondering when I'd be able to evolve him, but it seems it's finally time. The fact that the status window appeared right after I gave the page of Sloth away. Looks like the codex had an effect on the evolutions, but worrying about it won't give me answers, so no point in even thinking about it. And it says 100%, so let's evolve it first. Andreas thinks, he doesn't seem to suffer like a vampire. Maybe it's because he's undead. Someone knocks on the door. He puts everything back into subspace. Lucia says, Senior, do you have a moment? Salem is talking to Morn and says, Gramps Morn, can I ask you something? Morn says, Ask away. Salem say, The reason you gave me the information about the sloth. It's because you needed someone to protect Andreas. Am I right? Salem starts to laugh. Says, was that a yes? Well, 
You took such good care of Cain, and even his son too. No way. He was forced onto you by the empire, wasn't he? And it was hard to teach him because he had no talent. Morn says, Salem. Do you know the origins of necromancy? Salem says, why the sudden question? Necromancy is the pursuit of immortality. No more precisely. Necromancy is the pursuit of immortality for those you love. If t'was born of the obsession to keep the loved ones with you for Eve. What now? An old man's tale. Maybe, Salem says, aren't you also a sage? You should understand what I'm saying. Morn says, leaving it to my imagination. Looks like you got another tie to the Cromwell family. Besides that, Cain. Salem says, and even if I forced you, you wouldn't answer me. So I give up. Morn says, what about the lad? I'm curious to know what you think of him. I know you saw everything. Using that zombie bug to snoop around. Anyway, I'll tell you this much. That kid's going to be the most insane person in this world. Even crazier than me. I'm looking forward to it. The tenth part of the necromancer's evolutionary traits ends here. If you want to see more, please subscribe and like. And if you want to support me financially, you can join my channel membership or Patreon only for $1. Patreon and Discord links are in the description if you want to support me. And a special thanks to all my Patreons for supporting me. Thanks for watching.